Well, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I'm a complete outsider to this gang. Um, but it's been a very uh, interesting meeting for me. I'll be talking about some work that we've been doing in the Andes, the Central Andes, over the past eight years or so. Um, I think everybody has a pretty good understanding of the, the tectonic setting here, uh, South American plate moving westward uh, and converging with the Pacific plates of various sorts, more or less in that, that direction there. <clears throat> Uh, and, and yes, I'll, uh, I'll try to explain what this means as we go along. Hopefully everybody knows what a bobber is, but I have a picture. I have a picture towards the end, just in case, because I thought, well, maybe they don't fish very much over here. I don't know. Let's see what happened. Oh, yeah, so I'm going to zoom in on that, that rectangle right there, in, uh, mainly in northwestern Argentina. and. Uh, and talk about these enigmatic basins that maybe some people would refer to as hinterland basins. In fact, they have been called hinterland basins. Hinterland is a term that doesn't really convey much in terms of mechanisms. Bobber is a highly technical term that, that conveys lots of process. <laughs> so hopefully we'll step forward on this thing. Uh, the, the, the basins are uh, they're located up in the high central part of the Andean orogenic belt. Uh, hundreds of kilometers from the trench over here and, and from the, the active strain front out here on the foreland side. They are fairly large on the order of uh, 10,000 square kilometers or larger. They have uh, sort of oval to, to uh, elongated oval shapes. Uh, examples might be the Altiplano Uyuni Basin, which is probably a composite of two separate depot centers, at least most recently. The Atacama Basin maybe is one of these things. Uh, the Arizaro Basin is the one that I'll focus on most. They, they are sitting up at relatively high elevations between about 2,300 meters and, and uh, 4,000 meters. <clears throat> and as I said, they're far away from the active orogenic fronts. They, they're, uh, they're associated with dense anomalies in, in the upper mantle. Uh, and in some cases, they have Miocene counterparts, and what I'll do is focus on the Miocene counterpart here because that provides the record for the Arizaro Basin. And um, that, that these basins might be something different from sort of typical flexural basins or typical basins due to crustal stretching uh, is suggested, hinted at by a number of uh, broadband seismic deployments that have been done over the last 12 years or so by <laughs> Uh, a lot of different groups. Uh, I'm showing results from the Arizona group here, but the Germans have done several very impressive deployments throughout this region over the last uh, 10, 12 years or so. And, uh, but the results from all these different deployments are, are quite consistent. This is just a, a MOHO, depth to MOHO map from uh, an in-press paper by Susan Beck and others showing that uh, the crust is quite thick here under the Altiplano and the northern part of the Puna upwards of 70 kilometers. But it's, uh, it's pretty thin, well, relatively thin down here, only about 55 kilometers, and then it thickens up again in this region. The Arizaro Basin sits right about here in this region of relatively thin crust. Over on the right are uh, P-wave uh, tomography from another paper that's impressed by Sheree and others, also part of the Arizona group. Um, you can see the, uh, the slab quite clearly here. This is the slab 1.0 for reference. Um, these are just different latitudinal transects. I can't see it very well myself. Uh, this one is, is to the south. This one is sort of intermediate. This one's up at the Bolivia border right here. So they, they run more or less like this, this, and this. And uh, the key element to notice in these is this, this uh, fast anomaly that's shown here and here. And these are interpreted by, by Beck and others as um, blobs or slabs of delaminating lithosphere plus or minus uh, lower crustal material. And, and similar, as I said, similar interpretations have been reached by other groups of seismologists working in the region. Um, a lot of people think that these are a result of eclogitization of the lower crust and or the mantle lithosphere, and that that's what's causing the the removal of this material, that it's growing 
uh, in density by some process that basically are, are two candidate processes that people talk about. One is, is metamorphism, um, and the other is, uh, is a uh, sort of petrological, um, an igneous petrological restitic eclogite that some people refer to as arclogite. It's a very dense garnet pyroxene residue that forms underneath some large continental margin batholiths, such, such as the North American batholiths. <clears throat> Okay, so just to zoom in a little bit on the Arizaro Basin, it's about 100 kilometers in diameter. I've outlined it here with a blue dashed line. The geologic setting, again, we're up in the high Puna Plateau. Uh, the, the, the basin consists of two parts. There's a, there's a modern part of the basin, which is an active salar filling up with evaporites. Uh, and then there's a, a Miocene component to the basin, which crops out very well in the eastern half of the basin, but also pops up again here on the western side. The basin fill is folded, uh, and I'll show you some photographs of these, of these folds as we go along, particularly in the middle part of the basin. The northern half of the basin is bisected by a narrow ridge of granitic rocks, Ordovician granites, and there's a minor thrust fault on the east side of that range. Um, <clears throat> the, the maximum elevation in that range is about 4,600 meters. That's the Sierra de Macon right there. Okay. Um, the cross section that I'm depicting runs along this line right here, and I'll, I'll come back to this later and explain uh, why I've put the, the depth to detachment where it is, which is about 11 kilometers below the surface. This is the stratigraphy of the basin fill, the Miocene part of the basin fill. It consists of uh, two formations. The, the main one of interest is the Vizcachera formation. That's, that's capped by a thin unit called the Batin formation which is only a few tens of meters thick. The Vizcachera has been divided into three informal members, a lower uh, fluvial and aeolian deposit down here, mainly consisting of sandstones with a little bit of conglomerate, uh, a thick um, lacustrine member, which consists of stacked progradational lacustrine parasequences. I'll show you some pictures of those. And then an upper unit, which is 1,500 meters thick and uh, consists of uh, e evaporitic siltstone and, and uh, dr what we would call dry playa deposits. Geochronology for the section, th so the whole section is, is more than 3,000 meters thick. This is, however, a composite section, so we don't, we don't have a drill hole that goes vertically down through the middle of the basin, so this is the best we can do. It's a, it's a remote, uh, hard to get to region with very few roads, but we've done our best. Um, the geochronology is provided by uranium lead ages on tufts. There are numerous tufts throughout the section, and there are a lot of dep more or less depositional age detrital zircons in sandstones, and so I'll show you some of those data. And that age range spans about 20 million to 8.5 million. Here's a, an outcrop photograph of the lower member aeolian deposits uh, on top of uh, desiccation cracked interdune deposits. This is the, uh, doesn't, I can't see it very well, so you probably can't either, but this is a Google Earth image of the, of the, uh, the lacustrine member, the middle member of the unit, and um, it's quite an amazing unit. You can see clearly on Google Earth, you can count the different parasequences. These things are very regular, probably have some sort of a Milankovitch story to tell, which we're working on with magnetostratigraphy, but not for this talk. In outcrop, they look like this. They're, they're upward shoaling from profundal lacustrine offshore shales and siltstones to, uh, to sandstones at the top. The, uh, the tops of the sequences are capped by flooding surfaces, and then you do the whole thing all over again. And these are stacked one on top of another. In a measured section, they, they look something like that. They don't contain any evaporites. They don't contain any fossils that we've been able to find. They contain practically no bioturbation. They are full of climbing ripples, particularly in their upper parts. They look like what Bohax and Carroll would have called uh, balanced fill lakes. That is, the, the rate of influx of water is approximately balanced by the rate of efflux, so they stay fresh. They, however, were probably uh, alkaline, and, and that, that could explain uh, why there's there's no evidence of life anywhere near these things. Um, the upper part of the Vizcachera formation, the upper 1,500 meters or so, consists of, of 
just more or less randomly bedded uh, evaporitic mudflat and shallow ephemeral lacustrine deposits, mostly siltstone and uh, volcanic ash. So the depositional system situation is summarized here. It's dominated by lacustrine depot systems, open water lakes giving way to ephemeral lakes through time. Next, I'll uh, go through provenance data, geochronology, a little bit of, uh, I'll mention some paleoaltimetry data that was recently published and, and the subsidence pattern. <clears throat> Petrographic, standard petrographic data with quartzose grains up on the top here, feldspars, total lithic grains here. That's what these two triangles are. And, and the, basically the, the big message here is that, um, that they don't, th these things contain a lot of feldspar and quartz, but they don't contain a lot of lithic materials. They don't look like typical intra-arc basin type sandstones. Intra-arc basins and four-arc basins often string out between uh, the lithics pole and the feldspar pole, and, and you typically see an undissected arc through transition to a deeply dissected arc trend through time during the unroofing of, of a magmatic arc. These things don't look like that at all. So um, that, that's the main message from the petrography. These are detrital zircon data produced by laser ablation, multi-collector, ICP mass spectrometry. And uh, and what I'm showing here on the vertical axis is just relative probability in these probability density plots and age on the horizontal axis here. <clears throat> the, the story here, like, like every Andean sandstone that I've looked at over the last eight years or so, is extraordinarily boring. There's, they, they all look the same. They have a, a, a strong set of peaks here in uh, Ordovician and Cambrian time between about 470 and 530, which are derived from, from older Paleozoic arcs, the Famatina and Pompeian arcs. They contain a smattering of, of census origin ages around, which would be sort of the equivalent of the, the South American equivalent of the Grenville orogeny in North America. Those are coming out of recycled uh, Ordovician and late Precambrian to Cambrian uh, low-grade metasedimentary rocks. And then the younger signals over here in the, in the modern, or the, the Andean arc, as well as uh, a few grains in Carboniferous and Cretaceous age range. These are not available locally, at least, uh, especially the Cretaceous signal, and, and likely uh, is coming from, from sources somewhere off to the west in Chile. The Neogene signal, of course, is, is readily available right there. We're practically sitting right in the middle of the arc. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the story is that along the western side of the Sierra de Macon, there, there's a local source which is dominated by, by, shown by these two samples right here, dominated by these Cambrian Ordovician peaks and, and uh, the younger arc ages. And then uh, and the rest of the basin is, is seeing regional input from as far away as, as Chile, perhaps. These are just just a summary of the tough ages. I don't think I need to, to bog down. These are mean age plots. And you can see that the, the maximum age is down at the bottom, about 20.4 million years old. They get as young as about 8.5 million years old at the top of the section. The detrital ages are shown, the peaks in the detrital ages are shown by the, I've just connected up the dashed curves here, uh, taking the youngest peak in each of those uh, PDFs, and they get younger up section, which is nice. Uh, and they're just slightly older than the tough ages, which are shown by the solid curves here and, and connected by the red line. There's a little bit of thermal chronology available, uh, Barbara's work mainly. Um, Aptite fish and track ages indicate Eocene regional bedrock cooling, 37, 45, 38, throughout this region. Um, this is before deposition of the yellow material. So the, in other words, the region had already been exhumed. There was, there was uh, at least in this area, probably a granitic substrate upon which the basin developed. The gray rocks are, are the younger arc materials. The greens over here are Ordovician metasedimentary, low-grade metasedimentary rocks. So it's a pretty simple situation lithologically. The, there's a little bit of paleoaltimetry information available from the Arizaro Basin in rocks that are as old as Eocene, which are not part of the Arizaro Basin fill, sensu stricto. 
eocene through miocene ages. These are delta deuterium values that are, that are recovered from, uh, from uh, volcanic ashes, devitrified volcanic ashes. And what they are considered to represent are the, the isotopic composition of the waters of hydration that form in a rind around ash particles. And they're very negative. And when you, uh, you recalculate the, the paleo elevation, it comes out more or less equal, equal to modern elevation. So the, the message here would be that the region was already at fairly high elevation, and it was already exhumed down to bedrock, if you will. Here's a subsidence curve showing total subsidence in gray and the tectonic component of that subsidence in blue. The tectonic component ranges between about 0.6 and 1 millimeter a year. That's, that's pretty rapid for sedimentary basins worldwide. All of that subsidence was probably taking place up on the high plateau. The strain front had already migrated through this region a long time before this basin began to develop then it has to somehow get back to the surface. So there's got to be some post about 8 million years uh, exhumation, basin inversion. <clears throat> Somewhere along the line, very late in the history of the basin, presumably associated with that exhumation event, the basin, especially in the central part of the basin, was folded. The folds are quite, quite beautiful. They're, they're upright, um, generally chevron-shaped folds with more or less vertical axial surfaces, no particular vergence direction. And as well, the, the ridge in the background there, that's the Sierra de Macon. And there's a little, there's a little, as I said, there's a little thrust fault on the eastern side of it, which has a little bit of slip, pops it up, displaces it on top of the rocks a little bit, but, but doesn't do much else. So um, in order to explain the structure, if you, you, know, if you just do a, a simple bed length restoration uh, on what we can see, which isn't much. There's no subsurface data here, so this is highly, you know, this is pretty sketchy. Uh, but it's about a four kilometers of total shortening. If you just take a, try to do a Dahlstrom style depth to detachment calculation, you end up with, with 20 to 40 kilometers, depending on details of the fold shapes. Um, given the shapes of those folds, it, it's unlikely that the, 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 that the detachment is that deep. These are shallow level, relatively shallow level, probably detached folds. The alternative to that is that you've got contractional uh, inner arc fiber stresses if you've got a, a plate that's, that's flexed downward um, and, and uh, you have a cord length, that would be the basin width. You have a magnitude uh, of the flexure of four kilometers, we'll say, in this case. The, uh, the circular arc neutral surface, which would be this dashed line right here that subtends uh, the angle. Um, would, would lie at a depth of about 11 kilometers. And that's where that, that's where that depth to detachment right there comes from. So it's not, I, I wouldn't say that this is a, a solution necessarily, but it's an explanation that might work. Um, the other thing that would be, would be interesting about that is that the, the magnitude of deformation, the strain would increase as you go up section. So it's, it's not a typical sort of fold thrust kind of mechanism. Okay, so the, the summary of, of Things that we sort of know, we really know, um, is here. It's about 100 kilometers. It's shaped like a big petri dish. It's more or less symmetrical. Uh, it's more than three and a half kilometers thick, especially in its central part. Uh, it was hydrologically open early and then then closed, became an evaporitic system. There's no coarse grain halo around the outside of the basin, and um, it formed at high elevation upon a basin basement substrate that had already been uplifted before the basin began to develop. Um, the subsidence pattern was initially slow, but accelerated and then decelerated toward, toward the end, a sort of a sigmoidal shape. It was internally shortened late during its history and then subsequently uplifted and exhumed. Post 8MA has a central apex, more or less in the middle of the basin. There's no strong genetic relationship with bounding structures, normal faults, thrust faults, probably is not a flexural basin, Definitely doesn't drift I've been in, and uh, and doesn't appear to be an intra arc basin either. Um, it's clearly not a four arc, and some of the other uh, usual suspects. So it's a weird basin, kind of enigmatic. Um, and so let's consider other possibilities, like the formation and release of uh, gravitational instabilities. Going back to the geophysics that's been done in the region, would would sort of suggest that. 
that uh, maybe this is a candidate. And this is some, some older work done by Oz Ghosh and, and Russ Pislevich, uh, published in 2008. They, they, they modeled the removal of Rayleigh Taylor type instabilities, and they showed progressive evolution in the deflection of the upper surface of the model. Uh, in particular, uh, they, they get early subsidence shown here by the, by the blue arrow with the dashed line associated with, and it's circle over the drip. They had no imposed um, shear gradients or anything like that. Contraction was, uh, was centered also above the drip. They had some really nice, uh, Cruden and, and Pislevich produced some very nice models that show, uh, as you pull the thing down, it wrinkles in the middle, curtains in the middle. Um, and, uh, and the surface then pops back up as the drip uh, descends and eventually detaches. So th there's, at first order, it looks like this, this might have some merit, this approach. Um, Claire Curry and Huilin Wang, one of her, her uh, PhD students at the University of Alberta, have been doing some lithospheric scale modeling on this, uh, associated with this project. They've been using, uh, they're creating 2D thermal mechanical models using SOPAL and uh, looking at, at large model space, 700 kilometers or so on the horizontal um, with a free upper surface. They impose uh, an overall uh, flow of the mantle to simulate corner flow uh, above the subducting slab. They used uh, various parameters that are kind of standard parameters for this sort of work, I guess. I'm not a modeler, so I'm just sort of bringing the message here. Um, the, the key feature of the modeling uh, from the point of view of processes that they're trying to recreate is the development of a route. And the way to do that, the way they did that, was to, was to simulate the development of a dense eclogitic material at a rate of 80 kilograms per cubic meter per million years, in, located in the lower crust. And they located it in the lower crust because of their, their uh, sort of trial and error experiments. The key points from, from their modeling, this just shows that what happens to the upper surface through time at these three different stages, seven, eight, and nine million years after the onset of the model. Um, and, and this just sort of summarizes some of the, the, the main messages that they, that they deliver. The root uh, has a rheology of the, of the lower crust, the way they built the model. The, the crust has a strong viscous rheology, and, and that they needed in order for the root to couple with the, the rest of the crust in order to deflect the upper surface. Strain softening uh, allows the deformation to localize, which they imposed in the model. Strain softening allows the deformation to localize in an area that sort of approximates the scale of the Arizaro Basin. Without that softening, uh, the basin wouldn't develop as a very discrete feature, and you wouldn't have uh, localized shortening in the middle of the basin. Here's the Lagrangian mesh that's superimposed on top of it now to make it so you can see some of the strain. The main point here is that there's lateral contraction here and crustal thickening above the root. The root is the red blob. And, uh, and this is the modeled uh, subsidence history uh, shown in uh, the solid line and compared with uh, what I showed you before with the, uh, the tectonic and the total subsidence. So, so this would be the tectonic model component uh, of subsidence. So in cartoon form, it would maybe look something like this with the basin pulling down uh, late in the history of the basin, bef but before the drip releases, uh, the basin begins to shorten internally. And then, uh, and, and, and actually, it's interesting that because of the, the thinning that's going on down here, the basin actually starts to rebound before the root removes or detaches. And, and the, the root doesn't actually detach until fairly late in the game. And the basin is, is then uh, up at high elevation. So what are we going to call this kind of a basin? Well, um, I thought Bobber, well, actually, I didn't come up with this name. One of my colleagues came up with this name. So I can't be blamed for this. But I, I think it kind of works. The big question is, these things are forming up on tops of big mountain belts. And so I don't know what kind of a uh, preservation potential they have. And um, 
one would ask the question maybe, have you seen these in other thrust belts? Do you see them elsewhere in the central Andes? I'd say, like I, as I started off showing the, the original uh, digital elevation model, the central Andes, there, there are other candidates for these things. And indeed, they have been, in, uh, this kind of process has been sort of hinted at in the literature by others who are less courageous, perhaps, uh, or foolish to su suggest a name for the, for the thing. So uh, also, also there are candidates for these in the North American Cordillera as well. All right, so my conclusions then are that, that Arizaro Basin, at least, is a good candidate for, uh, for this process of, of dense lithospheric instability removal. Uh, it's, it's consistent with the geophysical data from the area, as well as the modeling. Other candidates, as I, as I indicated, for example, Lear and others published a paper in 2011 in which they sort of hinted at this idea uh, for a basin farther north. Um, one thing about this idea is, is that it sort of uh, it suggests that, that one ought to expect a lot of lateral inhomogeneity and complexity in the, the elevation of the paleo surface. The, the actual elevation changes associated with this process are minor. They're on the order of a few hundred meters, surface elevation changes. Unless you get a, a, a drip storm, and during which you have a whole bunch of these drips coming off at the same time, you might expect to get a, a more regional signal that way. But so far, uh, all the paleoaltimetry evidence suggests that these are sort of local patches that are changing elevation by hundreds of meters. Uh, I, I'm sure that those of you who are familiar with the Andean literature lately are aware of the, of the different data sets that have come out addressing the issue of paleoaltimetry. And it's a complex story. There's a lot of variability from place to place. It's almost like the surface was a, was a, a quivering pond uh, depending on what was happening in the upper mantle. These kind of basins, if, they, if, if, we, can, if we can find other examples of this, if we can, if we can uh, demonstrate convincingly that this is what's really going on, of course, it's interesting because there's all kinds of potential for, for linking relationships among these different processes, tecton tectonic, magmatic, and, and surficial processes in Cordillera and orogenic belts, but perhaps also in collisional belts. So I'm all done. You thought what? Question. You thought what? That a bulb was for slitting. A slide. bob. Yeah, well, that's why, that's why I got the picture. I, I thought there might be some misunderstanding there. <laughs> Simulation of the drip where you have the surface elevation, you had a sort of symmetry pattern there. Right, so that would give you a sort of prediction for the position of other basins. Do you observe anything like that? Well, I haven't been directly involved in the modeling, so I can't, uh, I can't answer that comprehensively. Uh, as far as I know, they have not been able to create, they haven't tried to explore that problem with the model. Um, the, the other feature, now that you, you raise this issue of symmetry, that's, it's, a, it's an important question. Um, in, in the larger scale models that Claire has produced, she's uh, imposed, as I said, a mantle flow due to corner flow. And, and that tends to, when the drips come down, they don't, they don't drop straight down. They, they, they get sheared dramatically off and quickly dissipated in the mantle wedge. Um, so it's, it's likely that, that it's not going to produce something quite so simple. The other factor is uh, whether it's a drip, a Rayleigh-Taylor type of instability, or if it's actually a, more of a sheet-like delamination process. And both of those processes are being modeled. And, and the big difference is scale. The, the sheet delaminations produce highly asymmetrical and migrating subsidence waves. Um, that are much larger scale, sort of sub-regional scale. And, uh, and, and actually in the seismic that I showed, the P-wave tomography that I showed from Beck and others, that's their interpretation of that particular anomaly. They think that it's actually a sheet that's, that's ripping off uh, and that if you go to the south, you can see it again, but it's in a different stage. It's already dropped off completely.
So there, there are likely to be lots of geometrical complexities in these things, I guess. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, maybe I missed it. But uh, what was before in these basins? Uh, the uplift, surface uplift of the basin or the evaporitic and arid conditions? Oh. Sorry, can you repeat the first? What, what came first in, 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 the, in the basins? Were they uplifted or were they, did they become uh, closed, uh, drained? Okay, um, yeah, maybe it's a little confusing because, because that's exactly what happened. Uh, the regional thermal chronology yeah. and the kinematic history of the central part of the Andean orogenic wedge demonstrates clearly that the, the contractional strain front had migrated through this region during Eocene time. Okay. So during that time, the region was uplifted, things were eroded, there was you know, some erosion, not a lot of erosion, appetite fishing tracks were reset. Then that surface was deflected downward and the basin formed on that surface. Oh, okay. So the, key, the, the reason I, I make such a big stink out of that is that the, the basins are isolated from active shortening structures. They're not typical wedge top structures because wedge tops form out at the fronts of thrust belts and are often graded to the main regional foreland level. And, um, and, and we're highly isolated from that. But you were talking about open drainage conditions uh, in the early stages, no, of one yeah. of these spaces. Uh, the, at, the, at, at what, what altitude was the, the basin lakes, The lakes, early on, the lakes were open water, standing water, tens of meters deep. These progradational sequences are typically as much as 20 meters thick. So I decompact that and prograde it out into a lake. You know, that's probably about lake depth. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a fresh water system. There's no evaporites early on. Later on, it's very shallow ephemeral lakes. And that's what I mean when I say closed. It's hydrologically closed. And at what, at what elevation could, uh, did this happen? And all of it was at high elevation. All, both things? Yeah. Okay. Um, Yeah, um, I, I like the model. It's, it's, it's it, um, just you were wondering whether other places where, where where this might be applicable. I know of the so this is just a comment, but uh, uh, Greg Hausman from Leeds he, he applied similar models to the Carpathians. We looked at. I think the the novelty here is that perhaps it's the um, the, the eclogetic material going through the lithosphere, right. which I don't think was a, was was tried in previous models. But I think. Similar, with similar conclusions. So, yeah. yeah, this kind of this kind of process obviously can act in a lot of different places besides up in the hearts of of uh, high Cordilleran orogenic systems. That's a good point. So, I, is that right? It looks like a completely passive feature. Yeah. There's nothing happening around yeah. it. I mean, yeah. Weird, not isn't a it? single conglomerate. That was my reaction nothing. when we went out there. Is I you know I was going out. We, we went as I recall. We went out there thinking, oh, we're gonna we're gonna f this thing. It's it's a uh, it's gonna tell us something about the shortening history and mm -hmm. the kinematic history of the mountain belt. And this and it's cool because it's interior and maybe there's some out of sequence <laughs> thrust faulting going on. And and, <laughs> and after about three weeks in this basin, it's it's, it's misery. <laughs> the I mean, even the sedimentology is really grim. So, no conglomerate. There's a little bit of conglomerate. There's one interesting set of outcrops with some mixed alluvial fan and aeolian facies, which is kind of peculiar. But uh, what can I say? Sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and everything is red, and the wind is always blowing. <laughs> Sir. Very interesting. Uh and quite, uh, let's say, impressive differential vertical motions in a short time. Uh, reminds me a little bit to, uh, let's say, what we have seen in some pool parts, bringing them down very rapidly, bringing them up, yep. also at the end. Um, in order to get away from the very large wavelengths of the Rayleigh-Taylor Rayleigh instabilities, you, you bring in the, uh, the, the pockets of uh, eclogites. 
uh, in order to, let's say, get in the uh, spatial wavelengths of 100 kilometers in your oval basins. But how, how do you produce this, uh, this, this ecclesiastes, these pockets uh, on this nice, uh, let's say, uh, spatial intervals? Yeah, well, first what, is of the, all, what is the control on that? Yeah, um, my own bias is that it's being produced by igneous processes. Uh, in the same way that it was produced underneath the Sierra Nevada bath lift during the Cretaceous. Basically, it's a restite, and the petrologic calculations, you know, if you look at the Sierra Nevada, the, the crust is 35, 32 kilometers of tonalite. There's no lower crust. There are eclogitic, archlogite xenoliths in, in younger eruptions that, that come through the Sierra Nevada. And so the, the interpretation of that is that there was a anywhere from about 50 to 90 kilometer thick archlogitic keel underneath the batholith that dropped off, or tried to drop off at least, and, and is maybe still dropping off uh, in some places in Southern California. That's, that's a restite. But, but here you need, let's say, a few pockets of these things, otherwise you don't get your string of oval bases. Well, here what you need are, uh, I th you know, what you have in the case of Arizaro, and also in the case at least of the Uyuni depression, there are big caldera collapses, big caldera complexes to the east of these things that could have produced these restitic blobs that were, were dropped off and sheared laterally and, and pulled the basins down that way. That's one possibility. The other possibility, which has been modeled by, modeled by, by Sobolov and Babeko very effectively, is, is metamorphic eclogitization just by, by pressure, solid, solid transformations. And, and that could well be the case here. So um, the, a little bit of petrology has been done uh, on late stage basalts that come up around the Arzaro Basin. They're all younger than about half a million years. And um, these basalts, the, the modeling was done by Mihai Ducha and a student. And they determined that these things were melting at about a depth of 40 to 50 kilometers, and that they were melting as they were dropping through the mantle. And um, that's how they produced, that's, that's how those basalts were produced according to, that, according to that work. I'm not expert in that field, obviously, so okay, I can't say much about that. Um, it just looked from the, the, the models that you drew that there would be a more prediction about stratigraphic architecture that you might see early onlap, that you might see deformation of the early, early deposits. Uh, is there anything about the stratigraphic architecture that you could use to really test some of these? The biggest is it really problem, a Petri dish, as you say? I'll tell you, the, the biggest problem, Hugh, is, uh, is this. Let's see. And that's Namibia, right? Or no, is that, no. That, that's Arizaro, that's Namibia. They basically look the same. Um, Mars, you know, I mean, this is the way the place looks. And uh, we, we don't have subsurface control, which you would want. And the nature of the outcrops is, is a wrinkled rug. And so you're, you know, it's very difficult to see the kind of relationships that you're talking about. The outcrops are excellent, but they don't, tend to show those long distance lateral relationships that are needed to track things like onlap and offlap. Related, uh, in fact, is in your very first picture when you show us the Altiplano and the whole system, you've, you've outlined these oval basins, but in fact the entire surface of the Altiplano was covered in late Neogene sediments, right? Yeah. Other than what parts yeah. they're poking That's out. Right. So you know, how singular are these things really, and, and in particular, can you really say that there's been excess tectonic subsidence, or has there just been excess sediment storage? Well, there, uh, the, Cor the Corque Coral Coral Basin is a composite basin, but it has about, about seven or eight kilometers of Miocene to through Pliocene fill, which cannot, cannot be explained by structural, just buttressing on structures, um, and in this case, we've got three or four kilometers, which I don't think works very well for that. I don't know. Maybe it's possible, but there are no there are no big structural steps upon which you can 
you can lap things out. Like I guess you're thinking sort of a bathtub, bathtub accommodation. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. You had a very rough surface to start with, though, right? Probably, yeah, presumably. And how much of the rest of the Alpha Plano do you think has similar basins? Like which ones are uh, old structural remnants and which ones are bobbers? Well, the, the modern uh, Ono's here, right? Ono probably has some opinions about this. Maybe he can feel free to, to blurt anything out that you want. <laughs> um, uh, the Uyuni Basin is, is arguably related to this process. There's a dense anomaly in the upper mantle beneath it. Um, I don't know the details of the stratigraphy in the Uyuni Basin. Ono probably does. But it, it's substantial. There's a, there's a substantial pile of Miocene and younger sediment in the Uyuni Depression. The Corque Korokoro Basin is, is a Miocene version. It's located in the northern part of the Altiplano depot zone. Um, Lake Titicaca, I don't know, maybe. Open water, you know, maybe that's a maybe that's something like what the open water version of Arizaro looked like. Okay, I think we're running out of time. Let's thank the